Hey guys, this is Mr. Crow, and uh, today we'll be talking about the ancient Greeks uh, who were, to a large extent, uh, one of the three main foundational civilizations to all of Western societies. Uh, the other two, of course, would be the Hebrews and the Romans. And the genius of the Greeks, and, and why historians spend so much time studying them, is that they of course made many advancements and innovations in ideas of philosophy, of art, and uh, advancements in science. But arguably the most significant contribution to world history that the Greeks come up with was the development of democracy or rule by citizens, rule by the people, as opposed to these ancient kings, pharaohs, uh, emperors that had come before them. And this is truly remarkable uh, in world history because this had never, this idea of democracy, this, this new political form had never existed in ancient civilizations up to this point. So we owe a great debt and, and a great deal to the Greeks and we're going to spend today looking at them. Now Greek history can uh, generally be divided into three periods. The first being the Archaic period. Archaic just means old. Uh, and most scholars and historians will point to the, the years 1650 through 1200 as being the Archaic period. What you need to know is that there were two major uh, cultures or civilizations uh, during the Bronze Age that existed in this Archaic period of ancient Greece. The first would have been the Minoan a civilization. The second would have been uh, the Mycenaeans. The Minoans uh, down here, uh, kind of in this gold colored island down here on the island of Crete. Um, and then the Mycenaean civilization. This is the pre classical Greek civilization on the uh, uh, Peloponnesian Peninsula up here. And so let's take a look at the Minoans first. They come first. So let's take a look at them. Um, they're a Bronze Age civilization. Uh, that arose on the island of Crete and came to dominate the shores and islands of the Aegean. Uh, the civilization flourished as a sea power, a maritime power, from approximately uh, the 27th century to the 16th century BC. So they're around for a long period of time. The Minoans are named after the legendary King Minos. Uh, this uh, the artist's reproduction of his, of his palace at Knossos on the island of Crete uh, is, is believed to have been built around the year 2000 BC. We know the Minoans grew grapes, uh, grain, and olives and traded with the Greeks um, as well as other civilizations in the eastern Mediterranean region uh, including Egyptians. And we know there's a great deal of cultural diffusion between the Minoans and other Bronze Age civilizations in that region. Uh, for example, the name Minos, from which Minoan civilization is taken from, is actually a Greek word, uh, I'm sorry, it's actually an Egyptian word that the Greeks adapt after trading with them. Uh, it's an Egyptian word for king. Minos means king. Some scholars actually see that there's a connection between uh, Minos and uh, King Menes uh, of Egypt, who united uh, Upper and Lower Egypt, if you recall. Now, the Mycenaeans, and you can see uh, there are quite a few uh, uh, vowels up there in that name, so I'll let you uh, write that down. Mycenaean is how you pronounce that. They are the civilization who come after the Minoans, uh, and as I said, from, they were from the mainland, the Peloponnese. Uh, they actually invade and conquer the Minoans on Crete by sea, and then uh, from roughly about 1500 to 1200, the kingdom of Mycenae is the dominant um, city-state or polis, we'll talk more about that in just a minute, uh, of Greece. Um, this period is often referred to as the Mycenaean Age, sometimes the Heroic Age, uh, or the Archaic Period of Greek history. Mycenae is actually the kingdom that is believed to have fought in the actual Trojan War that occurred around 1200 BC. There's not a lot of historical evidence from the Trojan War. In fact, a lot of historians or scholars uh, didn't used to it, 
they believed that it was actually a fictional war, but now we actually have archaeological uh, evidence that there was some kind of um, uh, major conflict between Greek city-states and uh, a kingdom in Asia Minor. Um, now, there's obviously not many eyewitness accounts, but what we do have, uh, in addition to those archaeological remains, is an epic poem, which uh, an epic poem is essentially a long story, uh, which tells of this conflict between uh, the Greeks and the Trojans, and also provides this uh, epic poem provided a cultural um, unifying narrative that all Greeks could point to. Of course, this epic poem is known as the Iliad and uh, was written by the poet Homer. The poem itself is over 16,000 lines long, uh, and what makes it even more remarkable was that before someone t actually took the time to write it down, it was passed down through generations of storytellers in an oral tradition. So there were actually storytellers that essentially had this entire thing memorized, um, which is uh, amazing. Oral tradition uh, in many ancient societies was extremely important. It was a way to keep the history or culture of a people alive, uh, and uh, especially before the innovation of the phonetic alphabet and uh, when scribes were the only ones that knew how to read and write, uh, oral tradition and storytelling was extremely important. Uh, and, and it also became a, a, a popular form of entertainment as well. So the Iliad is this epic poem. It's written by Homer. It tells the story of the Trojan War. And uh, what you need to know about it is that it was essentially the birth of literature in Western civilization. Yes, there was the Epic of Gilgamesh, the first recorded story, but that this is really uh, taking it a step further, and this is really the beginnings of what we would know as literature, the literary tradition in Western civilization. Uh, the other great uh, epic poem of Homer, of course, is called The Odyssey, which is the story of Odysseus's return to Greece after the Trojan War is over. Now, as I mentioned last week, a cultural parallel um, to these epic poems in Greece uh, would be in India, in South Asia, the Aryan or Vedic peoples um, in uh, Sanskrit epic poems, the Mahabharata and the Ramayana, which were also two great long Indian uh, epic poems. In fact, the Mahabharata was uh, ten times longer than both the Iliad and the Odyssey combined, so quite long. Now, scholars have different theories uh, for the decline of Mycenaean civilization, but most point to this invading Sea Peoples hypothesis, uh, which is also supported by other accounts during the Late Bronze Age in this region during this era. After the collapse of the Mycenaean civilization, this began the period in Greek history known as the Greek Dark Ages. And as you can see, it lasts from approximately 1200 to 800 BC. And during this time, um, the old major settlements and urban centers are abandoned. Population drops dramatically in numbers. There's very, very little interaction, very little trade taking place uh, in Greece during this region. And um, so this is, this is kind of the period in between the archaic and what uh, comes next, which we will call uh, and know as the Hellenic period of ancient Greece. Now the next period of Greek history is the one that is without a doubt the most famous, the period between 800 and 338 BC. This is really the height of Greek civilization, of classical Greece. Um, and this is the one that most students, most, most people are most uh, familiar with. This is the time of most of the important thinkers and philosophers, playwrights, um, artists, scientists, famous leaders. This is the time they lived in. People like Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, Pythagoras, Sophocles, Pericles, so on and so on. These, this is their Greece. Now, it's during this period it's important to clarify that the Greeks actually themselves didn't refer to each other, didn't refer to themselves as, as being Greek. They referred to themselves as Hellenes. If you read the Iliad, they're, they're always referring to, them, to themselves as being from the land of Hellas or being Hellenes. 
it's actually the Romans who later call the people of from the Peloponnesian Peninsula Greek because of traders who ca came from the island of Gracoi. So because of this, classical Greece is actually referred to as Hellenic Greece. So you might see that uh, from time to time. That's what that means. Now as mentioned earlier, the height of this civilization is from about 800 or 700 to 338. When we talk about Greece, we're not talking about a unified country of Greece uh, that we know today, for example. Ancient Greece was politically a series or a collection of different city-states um, with a, you know that had different peoples, uh, each had their own their own government, they had different uh, customs and social systems, different ec economies. Um, it was not one large national country or unified empire um, or, or something that we would think of um, in the modern sense uh, of Greece. And this was due to the, the evolution of Greece was uh, politically was due to the uh, separation of these city-states because of geography. Greece is very mountainous, many hills, and it was very difficult um, for, for there to be a, a lot of uh, large-scale interaction because of the geography so that so that over time they eventually uh, you know they evolve more separate they were much more united uh, through trade and uh, through the sea than uh, interacting with each other overland just be due to the geography it forced them to develop much more independently um, and so these city-states were um, were very independent, uh, almost as if they ran themselves as their own countries. Uh, and just as we discussed in Mesopotamia, a city-state was essentially a city that controlled the surrounding countryside uh, and the farmland or in that countryside, making the city-state a, a really independent functioning economy. And there were literally hundreds of these city-states scattered all over Greece, um, like Corinth and Thebes, and of course Athens and Sparta were two of the most important. These city-states in Greece were referred to as a polis, or the plural being polis. And a polis is, is actually today is the root to a lot of our words in our language that have to do with government or city functions. For example, uh, the word politics comes from polis. So does police, policy, even metropolitan, and some city names like Minneapolis, Indianapolis, and of course Superman's hometown of Metropolis. So these were all, of course, uh, derivations of the Greek polis. And so the polis is in a way a very small national system. So when you hear city-state, think for Greece, think polis. Uh, the polis was not only the major political unit of the area, but it also served as a cultural center where all the religious, social, and artistic activities occurred. And uh, government and religion were very, very much linked and mixed as they were in many of these ancient uh, early societies. The idea of separation between church and state that we have in the U.S. would have been completely foreign to any of the ancient civilizations that we've been reading about the six weeks. Each polis had one of 12 Olympian gods as patrons. For example, the great uh, city of Athens patron goddess was of course Athena and uh, just as in Egypt and Mesopotamia the Greeks were indeed polytheistic. Although the Greeks were relatively divided politically in their polis in their city-states the one time that they do come together uh, besides the ancient Olympic Games but, but the one time that they that they're really united and come together was, was when they were, of course, attacked by the vast Persian Empire. Uh, and this was a very important historical event because it's really the first time, really the first conflict, if you will, uh, between uh, the ideologies of East and West, um, which is going to be a, a, a recurrent theme that we'll see played out again and again in world history.
Now, Persia and the Persian Empire was just a vast uh, political state um, and, and military. It was located in modern-day Iran, and by 600 BC, the Persian Empire had conquered uh, and encompassed uh, Anatolia, Mesopotamia, Egypt, uh, and as far east as the Indus River Valley. Persia was the supreme military power at this time. Uh, it was considered the world's greatest empire, uh, extremely formidable. This was the superpower of the region uh, for the time period. They had a great deal of economic control as well as a military and political control over the areas that they conquered, uh, including some of the Greek uh, polis on Asia Minor that we'll talk about here in a minute. Um, the Persians um, divided their empire uh, into what were known as satrapies. And uh, they, after conquering each region, uh, they required submission and tribute, and then they appointed a royal satrap, hence the word satrapies. Uh, a satrap was was another name for a provincial governor, um, and that satrap managed that region uh, for the emperor. But after the conquered region um, gave taxes, gave tribute, uh, and uh, gave their loyalty to the Persian Empire, the Persians had a really hands-off approach, kind of a laissez-faire approach to governance of that region. They, they pretty much allowed the people to run their own day-to-day -day affairs as long as they acknowledged the supremacy of Persia and sent their taxes and tribute in. And so this was a way that they were able to grow their empire without having to really uh, military control uh, all of the different regions. Um, um, and, and other empires are going to follow this model. As you'll see, the Roman Empire does this. They establish provinces and put governors in charge. And uh, as long as the people aren't causing trouble, then everything was fine. In fact, we could say that the Persians were um, extremely tolerant rulers, and they can be considered more advanced uh, in many respects than, than most other classical empires during this time period. For example, the Persians are the first people in history to give men and women equal rights. Uh, they're the first to abolish slavery, uh, even though it did exist in some form, uh, but uh, there, were, there were many restrictions put on it. Uh, and they're the very first to write a human bill of rights. In addition, the Persians build a very modern, very efficient infrastructure of roads and ports along the so-called Royal Highway. Uh, they, they establish a uh, system of relay riders, much like the old Pony Express in American history, in order to communicate and connect the far reaches of their empire. So they were quite advanced in, in many respects. Nevertheless, the Persians were a conquering empire uh, that required submission and obedience. And this, of course, irritated many of the independent-minded Greek city-states. And here's an excellent map to show uh, the different city-states. These city-states on uh, the Peloponnesian Peninsula. This is, of course, mainland Greece. But over the centuries, uh, many Greeks began, many Greek colonists began to kind of do this island hopping across the Aegean, and they began to settle and establish colonies in Asia Minor, along the eastern coast of the Aegean. Um, and, and so these would have been known as the Ionian Greeks. And um, they lived relatively peacefully um, and traded and uh, were basically considered themselves Greeks as well. Um, by the way, Troy would have been somewhere up in here. This would, if you go back to the Mycenaean period, this would have been, right around here would have been where Troy, the Battle of Troy took place. Um, and so anyway, the, as the Persians move into this region, of course, they're conquering these Greek city-states uh, and angering them. And so the mainland Greeks, the Peloponnese Greeks, begin to uh, sit, feel threatened themselves and sense this impending uh, spread of, of Persian dominance. And so they basically take up arms in defense of their, uh, their cousins, their brothers across the Aegean, and begin to defend them from Persian 
uh, incursions, and this essentially begins what is known uh, as the Persian War. Um, and it lasts from about 492 through 449 BC. And uh, this war, of course, includes the famous Battle of Marathon. Uh, in, in 490 BC, about 25,000 Persians under King Darius's uh, rule and uh, under his generals, they land uh, at, at Marathon, right around here, right about here. Um, and uh, the you know the the Persians are surprised to find a coalition of 31 Greek polis. And they're actually um, surprisingly defeated here at Marathon, and, and actually Emperor Darius himself was killed. Now you may have heard the story um, that the Battle of Marathon in the Persian Wars is actually where we get the term, our term, uh, for a race of, of a marathon. Um, as the story goes, supposedly there was a messenger um, from the Battle of Marathon, his name was Pheidippides, who ran approximately 26 miles, which is the distance of our marathon, um, from Marathon to Athens to announce the defeat of the Persians. And then, of course, as the story goes, um, he, uh, he dies of exhaustion when he reaches Athens and um, after he gives the news. And if you've ever run a marathon, you might uh, feel some sympathy for uh, Pheidippides, but uh, apparently, you know, there's some uh, disagreement as to whether or not that's a uh, a myth or, or a real story. But uh, if you ever hear uh, the Battle of Marathon, that's where that name comes from. Now, Darius, as I said, dies at Marathon, and uh, very famous battle. Uh, but he then, of course, is replaced by his son and successor named Xerxes. And Xerxes brings the Persians back for a second Persian invasion of Greece, and they defeat the uh, Greeks at the Battle of Thermopylae. Now here's Thermopylae, and it's a little bit it's zoomed in here, uh, but you can see that this is this is where the Battle of Thermopylae occurs in 480 BC. Now, of course, Thermopylae is the battle that uh, the uh, graphic novel and film 300 uh, is based on. Uh, but uh, just like the, the film Troy with Brad Pitt, for example, please do not look at these movies as any kind of reliable historical source. Um, 300 is a complete fiction using a very loose interpretation uh, of this historical event. If you want to read about the Persian Wars, you want to really be um, entertained, I would uh, suggest that you read Herodotus. Uh, he is, of course, known as the father of history because he's the first to actually, um, he, well, for a couple of reasons. He's the first to actually organize his sources to interview people, eyewitness accounts, and then systematically write down a historical narrative uh, from the human perspective, as if you and I were there. And he leaves, this is the, he's the first to actually leave out the role of gods uh, in his historical narrative or in his story. And this is the first time that this had been done, um, to, to leave out a mythology, leave out the supernatural, which most historical texts from the ancient period are filled with. Um, and he re recounts historical events from sources and, and from eyewitness accounts. And that's essentially why he's known as the first historian or the father of history. Uh, Herodotus describes many famous battles during the Persian Wars, like the Battle of Marathon. Um, the famous uh, Athenian naval battle at Salamis uh, is also described in his History of the Persian Wars. And, of course, the famous battle at Thermopylae. Although, please keep in mind, of course, that Herodotus himself is, is Greek, so there is, uh, of course, going to be some historical bias in his account of the Persian Wars. And we don't have a lot of histories from the perspective of the Persians themselves. They didn't write histories, uh, didn't write things down like that, but we do have it from the Greek perspective, and of course the Greeks were enemies with the Persians, so um, obviously the way that they're described is going to be a, a little bit biased, so keep that in the back of your head. Now getting back to Thermopylae, the story goes that uh, according to Herodotus and sources, there are approximately 7,000 Greeks 
uh, under King Leonidas of Sparta who face off against a reported one million Persians. Um, now, were there really one million Persians? Probably not. It's probably closer to about a hundred to three hundred thousand Persians. Um, but the Spartans are able to hold off the Persians for seven days. Let me see if I can find that map again. Um, there we are. The Persians are able, or I'm sorry, the Spartans are able to hold off the Persians for about seven days at this at this very very narrow pass here at Thermopylae. This is kind of like a choke point. Um, you can kind of see the arrows. This is where the uh, a Persian army would have been marching in trying to get to, uh, to Athens here. Um, and the Spartans and uh, a coalition of four other uh, city-states are able to hold off the Persians for about a week and they were greatly outnumbered. Um, and when it looked as though the end was near, King Leonidas dismisses the bulk of his Greek army uh, and remains to guard the rear with, of course, 300 Spartans. Uh, after defeating the Greeks at Thermopylae, Xerxes continues on, sacks the city of Athens, destroys much of it, and in fact burns it to the ground. Um, and afterwards, um, you start to see the Greeks slowly make a comeback. Um, and their, uh, their first really important victory after the sack of Athens is down here, this very famous naval victory at Salamis. Uh, in 480 BC, and then there was another major defeat of Persian forces at Plataea in 479. And so uh, uh, the Spartans and Athenians during this time period, these are the two leading city-states, are able to work together and uh, defeat the Persians by 478 BC. Now after the Persians are defeated, uh, uh, let me get up to this other slide. There we go. After the Persians are defeated, this begins what is called uh, the Golden Age of Athens. Uh, and it lasts from about 478 to 404. This is when uh, Athenian culture and political influence reaches its height. In fact, Athens is, is perceived as the greatest uh, polis at this time, at least in the minds of Pericles and other Athenians, probably not the Spartans. But uh, they truly are very influential. Um, and they're extremely uh, proud of their achievements and, and they rebuild their city and, and become a shining example for many of the other polis uh, in Greece. Um, so the defeat of Persia brings Athens a tremendous amount of pride and um, uh, that's best exemplified by one of their greatest statesmen and leaders, the Athenian general uh, Pericles, uh, who himself was, was a well-rounded statesman poet, playwright, and orator, as well as being a military veteran. Um, he's what we would call today a renaissance man. Pericles uh, was perhaps, you know, the greatest cheerleader for Athenian culture uh, and the greatness of Athens. He was also one of the greatest uh, uh, contributors to Athenian development, Athenian democracy and culture. Um, and, and helped really rebuild, helped rebuild the city after the Persians destroy it. And so much of Pericles' work involves these massive building projects and rebuilding the city. Many of the, uh, the beautiful structures of Athens were built during this time, like uh, the Acropolis, the Parthenon. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, uh, Pericles not only do, does these things, but he gives the Athenians a sense of pride in themselves, um, and um, the Greeks are feeling extremely uh, confident during this period, of this golden age of Athens. Now, while the city of Athens is flourishing under Pericles in a material sense, uh, Pericles also brings about change uh, to the Athenian government. He wasn't the first to propose democracy. Um, uh, Solon the lawgiver and Pisistratus and um, some of these earlier um, 
7th, 6th, and 7th century um, uh, Greeks are the ones that originally begin the process of uh, democratizing the Athenians. But uh, Pericles makes some important changes in Athenian democracy. Uh, and this, of course, is one of the major ideas that Western civilization inherits from the Greeks, along with, of course, the arts, philosophy, humanities, the idea of humanism, but, of course, democracy. Uh, when you think of ancient Greece, you think of, you think of democracy. The word for people in Greek is demos. D-E-M-O-S. So democracy means literally rule by the people. In reality, in a ancient Athens, it was really only the rule of some people. Uh, to be a citizen of a polis was a privilege. It was not a right. Athens really only had about 4,000 citizens out of a population of about 300,000. So it's not a high percentage of people that were actually considered citizens, unlike in our uh, society today. Basically, anyone who's born here and lives here is a citizen. But uh, only about 4,000 out of 300,000 people were considered citizens. Uh, so it's, 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 keep that in, in your mind as, we, as we're talking about democracy. It doesn't really mean everyone. In fact, about 50% of the population of Athens were slaves. Half were slaves. Um, and, and of course the other half, they're only a very small percentage of them, were actually citizens. Um, and a little note about slavery in ancient societies, especially in Athens. Um, most of the work, most of the farming and agricultural work, and even the work around the home, uh, in managing the affairs of an estate and taking care of the children and tutoring children. This was work all done by slaves. Um, and slavery in ancient Athens, it didn't really resemble, say, plantation slavery in the South during pre-Civil War times. It was not um, always just a, a back-breaking, hard, um, slaving <laughs> labor in the fields. This was, these were uh, slaves performed, uh, you know, every role, uh, whether it was domestic or agricultural, any economic role that was needed, and they basically kept society running. Uh, but they were slaves, and they were perceived as other people's property, and um, it was very, very difficult to to become free of that. So, um, as I said, this was very common. The ancient world was filled with slavery, um, from Egypt to Athens to Persia. Um, slaves were generally taken as prizes of war, and they were essentially prisoners um, who were then taken and, and put into service. So, uh, ironically, the, the Spartans, who probably weren't as um, progressive or weren't as... Uh, concerned with uh, democracy and, and uh, human perfection and philosophy and the ideals that the Athenians were involved in, they had very, you know, much fewer slaves than the Athenians did. Now, um, only citizens could participate in uh, political life, as I said. Citizens had to be male, they had to own a certain amount of property, and they even had to have a certain amount of standing and achieve a certain amount of success within the polis before they were granted the privilege of citizenship. Um, and nonetheless, the highest authority in Athens was a citizen, not the king or a single ruler. The center of democracy was the assembly of citizens, and it addressed uh, all important issues and made all major decisions. And uh, the assembly met... Um, now, I forgot to show you this, the slave slide. Here's, here's actually some uh, uh, pictures of slaver, slaves working in uh, ancient Athens. This would be a, uh, uh, a depiction of slaves working. I believe this is an olive. Uh, they're, they're working in an olive tree. Um, um, they're picking olives here. Um, and then, of course, these guys, it looks like, are smashing grapes carrying grapes and smashing grapes, so they're probably making wine here. But yeah, as I said, uh, the assembly met on the uh, highest hill in Athens, and of course that was called uh, the Acropolis. And uh, the assembly met once a week. And of course they had all this free time to debate laws and participate in public forums and become part of the uh, 
uh, public discourse and community because the slaves were, were doing all of the work. Now besides Greek democracy, uh, the Greeks are also famous for their contributions in philosophy. I think most of us have heard of Socrates. He's of course the classical Athenian philosopher. Uh, he's credited with uh, creating the Socratic method named after him which was a um, philosophical method of inquiry and questioning to, uh, to get to the truth. Um, he himself, like Confucius, never writes anything down. Um, he, is, he is a teacher. He, is a, um, he, he was basically a thorn in the side of uh, Athenian leaders and that he would, he would get the Athenian youth to, uh, to start questioning authority a lot. In fact, they had, uh, they had Socrates uh, convicted in a court of law for the corruption of, of Athens' youth, youth and uh, actually he was uh, forced to drink hemlock, a poison, uh, basically capital punishment for that crime. Um, but as I said, he never writes anything down himself. He, he's a teacher, um, and uh, just like Confucius, his students kept a record of what uh, his teachings were. And uh, the first and firm, foremost of, of all of his students was Plato. Plato himself was a monumental uh, ph philosopher and scientist. He's a uh, founder of what was known as the Academy in Athens, um, and this was the first institution, um, a philosophical and uh, institution of higher learning uh, ever created in Western civilization. So along with his, his mentor Socrates and then his student uh, Aristotle, uh, these three, this triumvirate of philosophers, helped to lay the foundation of Western philosophy and science. And incidentally, we'll talk a little bit about Aristotle in a minute because, of course, he has a very famous uh, pupil himself named Alexander the Great. So you kind of see this progression of a mentor, teacher, and a student here throughout uh, uh, Greek history. Um, uh, Athens and the Greeks were also famous, uh, particularly Athens, uh, was famous uh, for their literature, for their writing, uh, their dramatists. They liked to um, write and uh, perform plays in amphitheaters. If you ever go and visit uh, Athens or any of the Greek uh, city-states and you, uh, you go to the ruins, and you'll basically see these um, amphitheaters, which are these um, you know, ancient uh, theaters that uh, had acoustically uh, dug in um, seats into the sides of mountains where you could basically hear the performance that was going on uh, below you. Uh, Aeschylus, Sophocles, Euripides, these are some of the great dramatists um, that uh, wrote about uh, things like Oedipus, uh, Oedipus Rex and Agamemnon and some of the uh, some of the cultural ideas that all Greeks share. And then, of course, the Greeks are also famous for their advances in uh, science. Pythagoras himself was a famous philosopher and, of course, scientist. He's famous for coming up with his Pythagorean theorem. Uh, Democritus was actually the first guy to conceive of a of a invisible matter, an atom. Uh, atom actually is the uh, Greek word for indivisible, um, can't be divided. It's the fundamental, he, he said it was a fundamental a piece of mat, um, element that all matter was made up of. And then, of course, Hippocrates, uh, the father of medicine, and uh, the Hippocratic Oath is named after him as well. Um, so, the Greeks then, uh, after the Persian Wars, they, they, of course, see the Persian Wars as their finest achievement. And these small city-states are able to really do the impossible. They're able to rise up, come together, and defeat this mighty empire. Uh, it was a true David versus Goliath victory. Um, Athens and Sparta then emerged from the Persian Wars as the two most powerful, powerful polis. But then, very quickly after the Persian War, a rivalry between these two uh, dominant city-states develops almost immediately and it's very similar to what I would consider the, the, the conditions and the situations after World War II um, 
during the Cold War that begins and, and develops uh, between the United States and the Soviet Union after the defeat of Nazi Germany. Uh, the U.S. and the USSR were, of course, two countries united against Hitler during World War II. And then as soon as the war ends, uh, the rival, there was a rivalry for control, and, and there were political tensions, and there were formation of alliances. And this is, this is very similar, almost identical, to what happened between Athens and Sparta following the Persian Wars. Now, unlike Athens, Sparta did not value art and philosophy and science. Sparta actually comes to symbolize the complete opposite of Athens in many respects. The Spartans valued military bravery and prowess above all else. Um, in fact, the city-state of Sparta was essentially an armed military camp. Um, there's a famous uh, tale in, in Herodotus's the Persian Wars where he's recounting a Spartan warrior uh, at Thermopylae when the Spartans are formed up against the Persians the Persians have so many archers and arrows that when they're they're shot at once uh, they would block out the Sun and of course the Spartan war warrior famously says oh, then we'll, we shall fight in the shade so uh, so this tr shows the true Spartan values. Uh, this warrior is not even afraid of the most overwhelming odds uh, in the face of this Persian army which completely outnumbers them. And uh, when there's almost certain death, of course, the Spartans are not afraid of this. Uh, their major values were bravery and honor on the battlefield. And everything, of course, revolves around the military. Um, the the value, of course, that was of utmost importance was honor. And the absolute worst thing uh, that could happen in the eyes of Spartans was as if you lost your shield, because losing your shield was essentially losing your symbol of honor. Uh, it, was, it was really better to be killed than to have your wounded body carried back without your shield. Death before dishonor was, was a very high value in Sparta. Um, now, a typical Spartan man's life would go like this. If, you're, if you were not a fit specimen at birth, uh, you were pretty much abandoned. Um, you were taken out to the countryside. Now, your parents wouldn't actually kill you, per se, but they would leave you out in the countryside, leave you outside um, as a baby or as an infant to die uh, alone, die of starvation or exposure to the elements. If you were deemed a fit specimen, then you actually uh, were, were cared for. You lived the first six years of your life with your mother. Your father was usually off at war, so you really never saw him. And then at seven years old, you were then uh, sent to military school, where you were taught um, athletics and military arts. Um, the Spartan mind was very austere, very plain. There was not a lot of finery. Um, there was not a lot of um, pleasure and in intellectual or cultural pursuits like plays and literature and philosophy like they had in Athens. The Spartan life uh, from boyhood through young adulthood into manhood was one of discipline, of honor, hard work, and military strength. Now, at 20 years old, you would then be, as a man, assigned to the army. You could marry at this point, but you're, you're really not going to spend any time at home, so a lot of Spartan men don't marry that early. In fact, they generally start marrying in their 30s and 40s, and it was often to women uh, much, much, much younger than they were, uh, in, in, usually in their teens. At 30 years old, if you're still alive, and you haven't been killed in battle already, you become a citizen of Sparta. And citizen actually translated into uh, equal. And then if you, if you made it all the way to your 60th birthday, if you made it to 60 years old, after 40 years in the army, you could retire. If, of course, you made it that long. Between battle and disease, the odds of you making it to 60 were not very good. So that was the life of the typical Spartan man. Um, the life of a typical Spartan woman was to be a useful wife and mother. 
They would help prepare their sons prior to military school. They would tell them stories of bravery and honor to help them understand the values of Spartan society. And um, also, with all the men off at war, Spartan women enjoyed considerably more rights and equality to men than elsewhere in the classical world. Spartan women had, had many more rights, for instance, than Athenian women did. Um, and it had to do with the fact that they were in charge that when the men were gone. They were running the day-to-day -day affairs. Uh, I would, uh, once again, make a parallel to World War II when the men went off to fight uh, from the United States overseas. It was uh, people like Rosie, De Rosie the Riveter and other women who joined the workforce. And then that's really when you start to see the beginnings of the women's rights uh, movement after the war, when you start to see women wanting to take uh, more active participation in society. Now, Athens essentially becomes the leader of many other polis after the Persian Wars. They formed and headed an alliance known as the Delian League. The Delian League. And this would have been uh, an alliance, if you look at the green here, these would have been the, uh, the allied states or the allied polis uh, in the Delian League. And uh, it was called the Delian League because, um, well, first of all, its um, treasury was centered here on the island of Delos. Um, this is where all of the money and the taxes and revenues that the, for the League were kept. Um, but the purpose of the, of the Delian League was that it was, it was a defensive alliance against another incursion uh, by Persia into Greece. So these basic, they were basically getting together and saying, hey, we need to... Uh, form a permanent alliance uh, similar to NATO, I would say, during the Cold War. NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization of uh, Western countries against the Soviet threat. Well, this was a, kind of an alliance of Greek uh, quote-unquote nations against the Persian threat uh, in case that uh, they ever invaded Greece again. So the League forms uh, after the Persian War and Athens gets 10% of the Treasury every year to not only keep up a, um, a navy to help fight off the Persians if they ever come back, but also uh, to fund reconstruction of the city after it was sacked by Xerxes. Remember, Xerxes and the Persians destroy Athens after Thermopylae in 480. So the Athenians had to rebuild their city. So they used the money from the Delian League in order re to rebuild their city. Well, eventually the Athenians take over the treasury from Delos completely and move it to Athens. So it, the Athenians begin to assume this position of authority. They still continue to collect taxes and tributes. Um, and this, of course, irks many of the other um, city-states, many of the other polis uh, in Greece, especially the Spartans. And the Spartans are not going to bow down and pay homage to the brilliance of Athens. They, uh, they of course, are Sparta. So uh, they don't see anyone as their equal, and they're not willing to uh, uh, continue the charade that uh, they perceive as the, the Delian League. And so they begin to form what is known as the Peloponnesian League, which is really their answer uh, to the Delian League, and it's composed of southern Greek polis in defiance of Athens. Now, so the tensions that exist between Athens and Sparta go on for many years. Um, a formation of alliances occurs. And eventually, in 431 BC, those long-term tensions um, uh, lead to the breakout of what is known as the Peloponnesian War. Uh, and this is the war between Athens and its allies and Sparta and its allies. Now be careful when you're, talk you're talking about the Peloponnesian War and the Persian War. Um, that one of the most common mistakes that students make is to confuse these two. They both start with P. Um, and, and so it's real important for you to take a moment to clearly differentiate which is which what the issues were, what the sides were, and what the outcomes were. The best way to remember, obviously, the Persian Wars uh, are against Persia, and the Peloponnesian War is, is taking place right here uh, on the Peloponnesian Peninsula. Uh, and so there's only uh, 
you know, it's a, it's a civil, Greek civil war, in other words, here on the Peloponnese. Now, Sparta wants to fight a land war uh, against Athens because they have the greater army and not such a great navy. Athens wants to fight a naval war because they had a great navy, but not really such a great army. And these competing strategies lead to a very long stalemate. The wars fought from about 431 to 404 BC. The war creates extremely uh, harsh and great devastation among the polis, among the Greeks who are fighting it. Uh, but just like World War I, uh, there didn't seem to be any measurable gains by either side. It was a war, it was a stalemate. It was, it, neither side really could get an advantage. It was just this, this long grind that drained lives and resources and really weakens both sides. And not just Athens and Sparta, but weakens really the entire region and all of the city-states that are allied with uh, both sides. And also during this time, during the war, to make things worse, sources uh, from the period tell of a great plague that broke out in Athens around 430 BC, which killed a third of the population of Athens. Um, so, you know, by the way, this would have been a great time for the Persians uh, to attack again. I mean, the Greeks are involved in a civil war, there's a plague, I mean, they're extremely weakened here. Now, if you're interested in this, uh, this period of history, uh, just like you should read Herodotus for the Persian Wars, you should really read Thucydides' History of the Peloponnesian War, if you're interested in the Spartan-Athenian uh, conflict. Th Thucydides was an Athenian general who actually serves in the war. And his account is widely considered a classic and regarded as one of the earliest scholarly works of history. Okay. Um, now, eventually, in 421, the Athenians and the uh, Spartans get tired of fighting. A treaty is negotiated to end the hostilities. But it's Athens who breaks the treaty in 415 and, and launches an all-out attack against Sparta. The Spartans, though, are too much for them in terms of pure military ability, and they're able to force Athens to surrender by invading Athens. Uh, and therefore forced them to surrender in 404 BC. And this is really not only the end of the Peloponnesian War, but also uh, the end of the Athenian Golden Age.